Okay, it's four o'clock Eastern time, and uh, I'm here with Frank Proshin. My name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry. I think we're both, I think, I hope we're both visible here. Um, I'm assuming. I can confirm. Are. Okay, you're we here. We are indeed. I'm here. Um, And let me, okay, good. I need to mute, okay. I good. do need to mute, okay. So these glitches. Um, uh, yeah, so welcome to our August 6th uh, Ballard Institute Summer Puppet Forum number 10 with Frank Proshin, who's joining me here from, where are you exactly, Frank? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., the, the center. Belly of the beast, the, the belly, belly of the beast. beast. And our forum today, present at the creation, the notion of performing objects. This is part of uh, a 13 part series of, of forums about puppetry and puppetry studies, whatever that is. It's the study of puppetry that, um, that we thought we would, we would create and pursue as after the COVID crisis started and we all were sent home and have been working from home. And it seemed like a good idea to try to get at some of the continuing interesting uh, issues about puppetry, which are so important to all of us. And um, we've benefited from uh, talking with a, a range of puppeteers and puppet scholars and I'm particularly interested in this, uh, this event today. A at the end of this uh, live stream, we'll talk about some of the upcoming uh, presenters, forum guests, and the ongoing series of live uh, puppet workshops that our graduate, our puppet art students, Felicia Cooper and um, Elise Van Ness are, are, have been providing as part of our online programming, another aspect of our response to the COVID situation. So here we are. Um, in, the, uh, in the past forums, we've looked at a variety of subjects and investigators and different approaches to puppetry. And today we're lucky to speak with Frank Proshin, who among other things is, uh, was the editor of a groundbreaking 1983 issue of the somewhat obscure scholarly journal Semiotica uh, devote. And the special issue that he edited uh, was devoted to puppets, masks and performing objects, which I think uh, is the first time that that, um, that that moniker was used. I, I copied that in uh, a, a issue of the drama review titled Puppets, Masks and Performing Objects, which came out um, in 1999, a number of years later. We're going to, um, to talk with, with Frank about the legacy of this initial study of, of performing objects, because the, the semiotic issue was the first time that Puppets, Masks, and Performing object, Objects received a cohesive scholarly analysis. We'll talk with Frank about that, as well as his work as an ethnologist and folklorist in Southeast Asia, and his work helping implement UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage programs across the, uh, across the globe. Uh, Frank is an anthropologist and folklorist who has worked as a curator at the Smithsonian Institution and a research professor at Indiana University. In 1983, he edited that special issue uh, whose full title was uh, Puppets, Masks and Performing Objects from Semiotic Perspectives, uh, the first scholarly study of puppetry and object performance, which included essays by semioticians, puppet historians, anthropologists, and linguists. During the 1980s, he collaborated with colleagues in Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia in research and capacity building on languages, folklore, ethnology, and museums. And in 2006, he took up a position at UNESCO assisting in the global implementation of the two, 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of Intent, the Intangible Cultural Heritage, uh, which has done a lot for puppetry or 
connected a lot with puppetry around the world. Um, and he worked on this until his retirement. He's retired. Congratulations in 2015. So I, I wanted to ex sort of explain um, my relationship to, to, to your work. Uh, it was super important to me when, um, when I went to graduate school at Columbia University after working for over a decade with Bread and Puppet Theater and uh, downtown avant-garde th political puppet theater that among other things traveled the world, which was a, an education for me. I was trying to figure out puppetry when I went, to, went off to study and especially um, where I had come from with the spread and puppet stuff, which came out of the innovations of 60s downtown performance in New York City, rather than a traditional marionette or hand puppet tradition. I was trying to figure out how could I understand that and how I could, that could be defined and connected to other traditions. My friend uh, Roman Pasca, who was also studying uh, graduate in graduate school uh, puppetry at Columbia turned me on to your semiotica issue. And uh, it was a revelation because instead of basing its analysis on the older traditions of marionettes or categories of marionettes, hand puppets, rod puppets and shadow puppets, especially from a European perspective, it started to look at a broader category of performing objects, which had and has the ability to consider those older forms in a global context, context and also to widen the field of study to include all sorts of things that we in, uh, think of in uh, considering what Jane Bennett um, calls vibrant matter um, or the material world and performance, which my colleagues Dacia Pasta and Claudia Ornstein uh, used as a focus for our Rutledge companion to puppetry and, and material performance. So uh, the semiotica issue made huge sense to me after my own experience building and performing with all sorts of objects as well as puppets. Uh, and it made sense to me as my understanding of global performance tradition broadened. I think the, I'm, I'm a little wordy here, aren't I? Um, th that issue laid the groundwork for everything our summer uh, forum series is trying to consider in a way. Um, and its inclusion of this wide range of forms um, in, in addition to traditional puppets and masks is super familiar to us. Um, the perspective allowed for an equal treatment of ritual folk performance as well as legitimate theater um, and uh, equal treatment of actors theater and puppet and mask theater, which in the hierarchy of theater studies is not always uh, considered. Uh, also the semiotica issue was consistently centered on non-Western theater, on Asian theater and African theater and not so much Native American theater, but it had a, by definition, a global perspective, which I think is so important now. So how did you come to think and analyze puppets, masks, and performing objects? What was your path into this? Well, it, it begins with my antipathy to Christmas. I hate Christmas. I grew up hating Christmas. And in 1977, was working at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife, uh, responsible at the time for putting on the annual Folklife Festival. And the last week of December, or the last few days just before Christmas, my mentor and, and boss at the time, Ralph Rinsler, said, oh, I have a visitor, Nancy Staub. She's here to talk about some, I don't know if he characterized it as crazy idea, but she's here to talk about this world puppet event coming up in Washington in 1980. Um, and as it happened, Ralph and I were the only people in the office in those last few days of December. If you know Washington, nobody's there. People are, are at home or visiting, whatever. So Ralph and I sat down with Nancy and she told us about what was coming in 1980, the 13th World Conference of, uh, World Congress of UNIMA, um, she was eager to organize a large performance program at the time. There were plans already under development to have a museum exhibit uh, 
which ultimately took place at the Corcoran Gallery. Um, and she was interested in trying to see what other organizations in the city of Washington could do puppet things, puppet related things at the, in, in conjunction with this UNUMA Congress. Right. Um, in other words, there would be the activities that were properly part of the Congress and part of the UNUMA festival. And then there would be a number of complementary activities throughout the city. Um, by theaters, by museums, and, and so on. Um, Ralph being super creative and super imaginative, and also kind of very excited about all sorts of, of possibilities, immediately then thought about what could Smithsonian, the National Museum do in terms of traditional puppetry of the world. Right. Um, and you know, so we in the first meeting, I think we we talked about a few possibilities. There had been very kind of intermittent right. participation of puppetry groups in the Folklife Festival in the past. The Monteos had been um, <clears throat> there at one point. There'd been a Toby Theater um, in the in the late '60s and so on. I should but, just explain that the Mike Monteo, the Monteo family was a, uh, an Italian American company in New York City that did Sicilian Marionette Theater. And excuse me for interrupting. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, anyway, so in other words, he, the, we were, the festival had presented puppetry from time to time. It wasn't necessarily a, a big part, but he immediately saw the connections. Um, Smithsonian at the time had this wonderful legacy program. Um, perhaps some of you remember what was called Food for Peace. The US would essentially send food around the world, grain and, and other commodities. Um, right. And the notion was that the recipient countries would pay for it in local currency. Uh -huh. okay. And then the problem came, what do we do with Egyptian um, currency or, or Ghanaian currency okay. or Indian rupees or uh, Pakistani. So Smithsonian had this fund called the Excess Foreign Currency Program, which would make local money available for researchers to carry out research in countries. And so we had a deadline, I think January 15th or January 31st. So again, it was the fact that I was there this, these last few days of December, we had to get this, pull this proposal together in the course of the next two weeks um, to carry to begin to carry out research in four countries at the time. Um, I go ahead. And I, I wanted to like we want to we're going to show some images too of the the Folklife Festival in 1980 and. Um, I uh, I kind of wanted to step back it, to to a little before that winter, if I could, and I think and and ask about your f folklore anthropology experience and your uh, University of Texas work, if if that's useful as a, a pre uh, precursor to 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 the 1980 festival. Does that make sense to you? Well, that that provides a bridge between uh, in 77, like I say, Nancy Saab came yeah. in December. We started this activity of trying to carry out research. Um, an ethnomusicologist from UCLA, Nazir Jarazboy, uh, received money to do research in India and Pakistan on Katputli marionettes. OK. Um, and a Smithsonian uh, uh, this excess foreign currency program, the food for peace money, right? Got it. Those those countries arose simply because there were four four countries in the world. Um, the other two Got countries it. were Egypt and Guinea, in West Africa, and we had an ethnomusicologist colleague, Halim El Dab from Kent State University, and Wonderful. again wrote the the proposal for him to carry out research on the Aragus in Egypt and the various puppetry traditions in Mali 
uh, I'm sorry, in Guinea, mm -hmm. in West mm -hmm. Africa. There was people who researched the puppetry of Mali. Um, Mary Jo Arnoldi was working on that for her doctoral sure. dissertation and so on. Yeah. Uh, Pascal uh, Imperato had worked on puppetry in other West African countries, but Guinea was terra incognito. Mm -hmm. Um, so and so I, I wrote the proposal. I did the kind of the logistics of getting them um, holding their hands from a few thousand miles away as they were confronting okay. um, the visa issues and the logistical issues. Um, and then, as it turns out, Halim El Dab was a wonderful researcher, but not a great report writer. So okay. um, a few months later, August of 1978, I decided to leave Smithsonian and go back and get my bachelor's degree first okay. and, and then presumably continue with, with graduate study. So I went to the University of Texas at Austin, but still kept a toe in the Smithsonian, right. helping to follow up with these arrangements for what performances would later come in in 1980, but also working intensely on uh, Halim Eldab's research okay. notes from his trip to, to Guinea. Um, I turned that into a bachelor's thesis in 1980, um, on, which was just kind of a desk survey, a desk study of, of puppetry in Africa. Um, and I think what was, what was notable, uh, again, about, it was, Nazir was working on Katputli which was in a sense a kind of a known quantity, right? The the string string puppets from Rajasthan. Sure. Um, and it was. Um, I think he also, even in those early conversations, also talked about the the Pabuji, the the scroll paintings. Yeah. Um, but I'm I don't recall whether he actually did research at that time. Hmm. But for Aldab working in Guinea, he. We knew about these, the 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 rod puppets manipulated from below, um, that from the uh, uh, Mali Guinea tradition. Sure. Um, but beyond that, again, it was pretty much terra incognito, mm. and El Dab took a very broad view because he was looking not only at at those puppets, but at some huge giant masquerade performances, right. um, and then at one point, you know, at children who were dancing in the style of puppets and right. yeah. and assimilated assimilated in the the local tradition to, you know, puppetry um, and you know behaving as such. So you know, he kind of imposed this very broad view of puppetry. Um, and Ralph being Ralph and uh, omnivorous and voracious in, in right. his appetites, you know, it all made perfect sense. So um, the, so, but uh, go with, yeah. Yeah. So, it, like, it's, it, I'm understanding that, that through the Smithsonian's work, you're, you're connecting with um, folklorists or people looking at traditional puppet and object performance all around the world. And then it's, it's my understanding is that at the University of Texas, you that's where you became exposed to a whole group of scholars who were looking at semiotic theory. Mm -hmm. My sense is that that's where you sort of put these two things together. Is that right? Right. And it was I I took to Texas my interest in in puppets and my I still had a you know a, a contract with Smithsonian to write this report and to okay. you know help with some fundraising and so on some uh, so on but we also um, again I, I fell into a very receptive um, environment at Texas um, which was very uh, the the folklore and linguistic anthropology cultural anthropology departments were were very excited by at the time the development of what you know later became performance theory right. um looking at folklore verbal arts as performance um and what is involved when a performer takes on responsibility for performing in front of an audience 
Um, that was just emerging. Again, we're thinking late 1970s, so that was really just emerging mm -hmm. at that time. I looked back at some of my my class notes and my term papers and so on, and I was in in 70, 78 and 79, I was already writing papers searching for something about a, a, um, a theory of a performance theory of material folklore crafts in the first instance, okay. and then later a uh, theory of material objects as performance. And so, um, so did, did you, did you, did you come up with that term performing object, do you think, or did you find that in other places? It's 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 a, a common term now, right? Um, I think I I was trying to reconstruct. Um, I think it first came up um, in that period in the proposals that I wrote for the University of Texas to okay. organize a number of scholarly activities in Washington D.C. in conjunction with the Smithsonian festival of traditional puppetry right. in conjunction with the Unama World Congress. Yeah. Um, and um, the earliest document I have that, that has that is the pro proposal that, and it would have been the second version of a proposal already in 1979 yeah. to the NEH, um, talking about puppetry as the core, but looking at performing objects, because again, by then it was, it was obvious from the discussions of possible presentations that we were very interested in having yeah. the the scroll paintings from 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 India or some of yeah. these other African things that might challenge the the preconceptions of what puppetry proper would would be. Um, I think it the 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 1980 festival that we want to talk about and show images of is it comes up it, like for example in this new book by Leslie Ash who was one of the organizers of the Henson uh, festivals in New York City in the late late 1990s and she she writes about the 1980 festival uh, in, um, and her, collabor her collaboration and the work of Nancy Staub, who I believe is listening right now. And our I friend, hope, I hope. I think so, she's here. Um, Ale Lou Curtin, the late Ale Lou Curtin. And that festival for my colleague, Bart Rocco Burton at the Puppet Arts Program also was a very important defining moment. And it seems to me that Oh, uh, you know, while like Jim Henson was so influential and in having the Unima Festival happen in Washington, the sort of intellectual backbone of it is is coming from the Smithsonian and your work, and that which is looking at, as you said, a variety of different international forms and also, you know, traditional what we would call puppets, but also scroll painting, you know, narrative of painting and uh, other types of performance that, that as you've just said, are uh, starting to be thought about it uh, as performing objects. So, so this, um, maybe I should go to the image. So does that sound about right? Yeah, I know it's basically there were two, again, these two events that I was, largely involved with the puppetry at the Smithsonian, the performances um, that looked at traditional puppetry from around the world, including the US, the Monteos were there uh, from, from Brooklyn, um, right. the, the, the Katputli and the scroll paintings, and I think a Karnataka group from India, um, the Aragus from, uh, uh, Egypt, Egypt and there's right. a, a, a range of traditional puppetry performances and then the University of Texas with the NEH funding organized these scholarly activities one right. being intensive documentation video documentation of the performances and interviews with the performers what we were called uh, exchange sessions where we had a core of folklorists and anthropologists working on um, interviewing these puppeteers from around the world. But then this two-day uh, 
conference on puppets and performing objects. Right. Um, and there was probably the first kind of public use of that notion of of performing objects. And I think it it may be hard for people to see the screen, but we had quite a luminary uh, uh, right. participation. And and again, very broad. A lot of ethnomusicologists, folklorists, right. anthropologists, theater historians. Um, we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, Yurkowski was there. Right. Um, Bill Baird presented. Right. Um, Basil Malovsarov from uh, Dartmouth. Right, uh, 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 you know, American uh, puppeteer of the of the 1940s. Sure. Um, we had. Uh, Sumak on... Sam, who's watching this program right now. Ah, great, um, great. From Wesleyan okay. University. Uh, okay. Um, uh, we had, you know, people talking about Afghan puppetry, Iranian puppetry, Kathy Foley. I'm not sure if I know she joins us sometimes. Right. Um, uh, again, Mary Jo Arnoldi talked about the Bamana and Bozo. Sure. Um, Paul and... Fournel, who's a great French puppet historian, talking about Guignol. Uh -huh. Um, so it was quite, quite, quite broad, uh, quite diverse, um, a very full program, as you see. Yeah. Um, I, being responsible and naive, put myself on the very end of the program of the first day, figuring, well, if we're running late and need to close, I can cut my own remarks down, I can edit on the fly. And right. um, I'm sitting there on the podium as part of this panel of, of three or four speakers. And the first speaker was Nazir Jarazboy, who proceeded to present all of the conclusions of my paper. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> and I'm sitting there uh -huh. saying to myself, please, uh -huh. please stop, stop, uh -huh. stop. So what did you end up saying? Did you have to? I said, well, basically, you've already heard everything I had, yeah. I had to say, yeah. and we're running late anyway. So um, it was uh, it was convenient, but it was it was in a sense kind of I'm, I'm sitting there gri gripping my hand, saying, please leave me a little bit to say. You know, right. don't 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 steal. And I mean, he gave me credit. It wasn't that he was he, but he just. I had shared a draft of the paper with him, and he presented all of my points. And it was kind of well, that, that was it. Um, I, I think so. that, like looking at the um, looking at this uh, uh, program again, you know, you're seeing the um, really an amazing array, as you mentioned, um, Bill Baird, who's such a major American puppeteer. Uh, one of the great puppeteers uh, from the Western tradition, and then people who who've sort of defined what we look at as puppetry now, a, a, as you also mentioned, but Ward Keeler and um, Ro Roberta Reeder and uh, Kathy, as you mentioned, William Beeman, um, Mary Jo Arnaldi, as you mentioned. Uh, John um, Amy uh, was very active John at the Amy. time. Yeah, right. um, Andrew Drummond, uh, who from King, who we have a connection with from the Ballard Institute, mm -hmm. and and as you mentioned, Malovsarov, Pascolino, the 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 amazing historian of Sicilian marionette theater, mm -hmm. Yurkovsky, as as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, I guess I wanted to note that because it's like the um, uh, the nature of of of. Uh, what we think about now is as puppetry is is being um thought of in in that moment mm -hmm. um wait a second i just lost the the feed uh, whoops okay so um i'm my my colleagues emily wicks and elise vaness are suffering from a blackout from the uh hurricane isaias and so i'm trying to manipulate things alone here technically and not necessarily doing a great job. You're doing a great job. You're doing a great right. job. I, um, maybe I'll, I'll so, just at this moment uh, uh, turn to some of the comments that we're getting, but I interrupted you, Frank. I, I was just going to say, you know, it's the, the, um, I, I saw Nancy's question about the, the Liege puppet performances. 
Um, and again, and it was one of our University of Texas team was Joan Gross, um, right. who then and it was met the puppeteers from Liège at the Smithsonian uh, programs, uh, interviewed them and so on, then went and did her dissertation research. Um, and it was, there was a real kind of um, seed planting um, sure. with, with people who um, were part of that, that, that research team. Mm -hmm. um, and research and documentation team, some of whom then, again, Joan mm -hmm. contributed to the Semiotica issue. Right. Um, uh, Tom Green, who was part of our, one of our interviewers. Right. Pasqualino, who again was part of our research right. team for the University of Texas, working with the, the Sicilian puppeteers from Brooklyn, you know, interviewing and documenting them, sure. um, as well as participating in this in this conference. So. And, I, and I know for us, like my, my friends from Bread and Puppet Theater, one a huge influence on Bread and Puppet Theater was, uh, has been Sicilian Marionette Theater. Hmm. And I guess in particular, the work of the Monteo family, which the Bread and Puppet director Peter Schumann saw a lot of in New York City. And viewing, viewing the uh, Monteo family and also the Egyptian Adagos performances and the performances from India was had made a, had a very strong effect on on the bread and puppet theater um, company. So I think that was happening all over the place. And maybe at this moment, I'll just turn to some of the comments we're getting. Uh, Carol Sterling from New York says, "What a glorious puppet exhibit ex exhibition!" Which is part of it was at the Smithsonian. Thank you, Nan Nancy and Frank and your team. And Professor Sumarsam says, "I presented my first paper in English on Japanese Wayang at that conference, and we see his name in the um, in the program." Thank you, Sumarsam. Colette asks a question about puppets and performing objects, which I, maybe we can get to in a second when we talk about the semiotica issue. And then Nancy, as you mentioned, says, don't forget the King of Belgium sponsored the Liegeois puppet performance and exhibit and loaned us a tent, the only king I've ever met. Um, uh, and Rachel Koppel says, the secret best of folklore festivals, the amazing connections made afterwards at night, which makes a lot of sense. So anyway, even now people, um, our, our viewers anyway, are talking about this, this event that you played put such a strong role in defining um, as being a, a, an important nexus of, of, of puppetry and puppetry studies. Uh, I interrupted you. No, no, I was going to um, uh, just say then, yes, and as we are getting then to the issue of defining the field or, or yeah. defining performing objects. We, we mentioned that the term figured in to the NEH proposal, the planning at Smithsonian, we had talked about certain things that didn't work out, Eskimo string figures, and you know uh, some you know other ritual objects uh, from Native American traditions that you know would not necessarily be strictly defined as puppetry, uh -huh. um, conventionally de defined. Um, the um, but that term snuck into the into the title of the conference um, without a lot of. Um, theorizing, shall we say. Okay. Um, I talked about Halim Eldab's work in, in, in Guinea. Right. And then I, at the same time, the, the festival and the conference were in June 1980. And in the same month, I had to f finish my, my bachelor's thesis. Okay. And I, I had mentioned that I, I did a, a thesis, a death study of African puppetry. Okay, right. Um, and how old are um, you at this point? Are you in your twenties at this point, or something? Yeah, and as I was okay. uh, by then twenty-eight, probably. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, you doing uh, the, the desk work on the Guinea? Guinea yeah. Research. Uh, no, no, but but the, looking broadly at at and as influenced by El Dab's, shall we say, Catholic taste and and perspective that there wasn't a, a clear line between puppets and and. Okay. The masquerades, right. um, look, doing the desk study of African puppetry, where again, there were 
there were string figures, there were children's toys, there were kind of these jumping jack kind of manipulated objects, play type objects, um, as well as various kinds of puppetry traditions. Doing that desk survey, um, I think it was what I, um, came to was that the the it was, we couldn't fit all of these African traditions into puppetry. Right. And of yet course. they were they were recalcitrant to being co-opted into a single right. uh, category and it would do violence in a sense to the fact you know first of all there would be there would be these folk um uh classifications ethnic ethno classifications what constitutes a mask what constitutes a puppet in some languages it was the same word there right. was no difference right. in other languages there were three or four or five different types right. um, and these were carefully to impose a single term puppetry on them was to do violence yeah. to them um so and again this, could... that made a stronger argument for the notion of performing objects and if As... I could interject, if I could interject, oh, I just interrupted you. You're about to say performing objects, but I, I wanted to say that, like in in my work, for coming from the you know whatever the downtown avant garde roots of 1960s United States performance with bread and puppet theater, what struck what I was dealing with was using the same approach that I would bring to the performance of a rod puppet or a rod marionette or a mask or an over life size puppet, the same approach to a, a can or a bottle attached to a string that was also part of our performances because we would use objects all the time just as much as we used puppets. But, you know, so just as you're saying in terms of your analysis of African performance traditions, from the perspective I was coming from, there was also this great overlap and it didn't make sense to say, well, now I'm doing puppetry and now I'm doing something different. It was all the same thing. So I, it's interesting to me that we were coming at that from a kind whatever late 20th century United States avant-garde puppetry perspectives and you were coming at a similar uh, situation um, from your own perspective, mm -hmm. but you were just about to say something. <laughs> no, I was just I'm going to say, and it was, I, 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 um, it was the first draft of what later became the semiotica introduction. Um, I talk about the usefulness of having a new and comparatively neutral term. It was, it's often useful to invent a term that um, rather than trying to argue over is it a, is it or is it not X or Y or Z, um, invent a new term Q and say, you know, we're not interested in drawing building building walls and, and drawing lines. Right. Exactly. And then I, I said, you know, um, at, in this in this first draft, which didn't make it into the final, but it, was, it is simply impossible to propose more restrictive categories such as puppets or masks into which African traditions can be readily inserted. Right. Ethnographic reality plays havoc with our vain hope that everyone will behave the way that we do. Was to try to impose a Western Eurocentric right. conception of how the world should behave right. was antithetical to me as an anthropologist and folklorist. Right. Um, and therefore, in a sense, is seeing the similarities between scroll paintings and peep shows and right. string figures right. and um, you know puppets and automata and you know ventr ventriloquism, ventr vent dummies, and so on. There's all of those kinds of things imposed this new category right. on on me it, it came mm. in, in a sense it just grew it it came up naturally i don't think anyone ever resisted it everyone kind of said well yeah that makes sense of course you know it's it's a good way of going about it um that um we should 
cast a very wide net mm -hmm. and see what right. similarities and differences there are mm -hmm. um and um then um you know draw lessons from those similarities and differences rather than imposing a priori a particular categorization or um typology yeah. so Mm -hmm. um, Nancy Staub comments, uh, the curator of the DC African Museum told us, Jeffrey and me, calling any African object a puppet would be an insult. Later, uh, I guess he understood the concept and mounted a marvelous exhibition for our festival. But I, I think that talks to the fact that, you know, the definitions of puppet uh especially in the west and in european context as you as you pointed out were, were and sometimes are often like putting up walls like you know we, puppeteers we get into these discussions even now if, is that a puppet you know and like there's some group of things that are puppets and those are good and then there's some other things that we don't aren't, aren't really interested in and i think what you're talking about is this bro broader form which actually we're living in now and i would and i i think it's very important to underline the fact that 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 this approach that you're talking about is um not ce uh centralizing european culture but it's 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 wanting to look at as you said you know, African culture, and it's wanting to look at Asian performance culture, and it's not seeing as other people had have been doing and are doing, have been doing, it's not seeing the Euro European or European American culture as, as you suggested, as the, you know, the primary source of puppetry. And I think that's super important, especially even in 2021. Right. Um, I, I, I... To pick up on Nancy's comment, just to call out the name Jeffrey Lariche, okay. you know, who's the Jeffrey she's speaking about, who, um, when I abandoned Smithsonian and moved to Texas, Jeffrey was there, a colleague who picked up the and continued the work of organizing all of the Smithsonian proper activities. And it was the actual festival was Jeffrey's work, um, whereas the University of Texas team was kind of parasitic on all the performances that that he was organizing, and so he deserves um, to be to be memorialized um, in okay. that context. But um, I think the other thing, and this can maybe bring us back to um, the notion semiotics. of of semiotics and and so yeah. on. Um, it was again, I I arrived in Texas seventy eight in this milieu. Um, which was one that very much encouraged creativity, imagination, um, and um, kind of exploration. Okay. Um, not Is this like in, in particular not, in the folklore department or what? folklore and linguistic anthropology. Got it. Um, largely, but but it went beyond that in the sense that at at the university at the time. There were people like Michael Holquist, who was a translator uh, and okay. introducer of Bakhtin to mm -hmm. uh, literary studies. Um, there was a, a, a linguist and, and um, uh, of, of Eastern European languages, but himself a, a Czech, uh, Frantisek Galan, okay. who was in a sense, a much younger generation, but continuous with the Prague circle um, and had right. mastery of all of that, that Russian and, and Czech um, right. scholarship. Um, but what was interesting was um, that, again, for the, the, the two, two of the pioneers in, in establishing first the Moscow linguistic circle and then the, the right. Prague uh, linguistic circle, Roman Jakobsen and uh, yeah. Pyotr Bogatyryov. Um, right. Again, like Eldab in Guinea, were very broad ranging in their in their interests. So in the in the first years of the revolution, and in Moscow in 1917, 
Jakobsen and Bogatyryov were doing field work in the countryside outside of Moscow right. on Russian puppetry, fairground performances, clowns, peep shows, uh, the Skomoroki, the, yeah. the, 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 the kind of minstrel, wandering right. minstrel. And in a sense, again, bringing all of these um, subaltern fairground kinds of performances yeah. as being something worthy of serious intellectual curiosity. And if I could um, interject because that... again, because uh, partly because they were interested in in language and how it works. Yeah. And all of these forms involve such wonderful, complicated uses of of language. I, I, I wanted to jump in here just for a second because um, semiotic studies and semiotic theory is, is so central to our understanding of um, puppets and performing objects because of Jakobsen and Bogotirov, who um, Steve Tillis uh, mentioned a little bit when we, when we did our interview with him um, last week. And I just wanted to, I wanted to contextualize this by saying, for example, when I started doing my graduate studies in the early 1980s, the beginning of postmodern theory, which to a certain extent come, is based on or connected to or comes out of um, uh, semiotic theory in part. But um, as I think you, 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 you've said, you know, it, it sort of came to the forefront and now semiotic theory is not so central. But although semiotic theory, as you've just said, starts with um, the study of language with the Moscow and Prague schools, it, as you also said, it shift, it, it included folk culture and that of necessity meant going into puppetry and looking at puppetry and mask performance and trying to figure that out in terms of what I would think of as the sort of scientific, as if you, the social scientific approach, meaning the scientific method is how I would think of it. I'm thinking a little of Bruno Latour perhaps, but the scientific method, which makes you think, I got to look at absolutely everything out in the culture, including fairground performance, as you said, um, which had been looked at by the symbolists, you know, in the late 1890s in Russia as an important thing and Petrushka folk culture, but, but now with semiotics, we're getting um, a real uh, scholarly look at folk culture. Mm -hmm. This image of uh, Peter Bogatira for looking at is the, which you shared with us is important. It's a postcard, I guess, because at the same time in 1929, the Union Internationale de la Marionette um, is created in Prague. Uh, we've been talking about the Prague School and Bogatirov is, is involved with both. And so this is a particularly important moment in puppet history because Unima is being formed and the Prague School uh, uh, semioticians are at work. And then, um, thank you for your patience with me, Frank, you are um, in University of Texas in the 1980 um, or so, taking in all this Prague school work and uh, having the experience of, of, of being already involved in puppetry. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for my interruption. No, 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 no. Um, no, I think you know, it, it brings us back then to, um, it was through the puppet festival and conference and documentation project in 1980. Um, and the team that was constituted at Texas, Richard Bauman, who was uh, my mentor, um, Joel Scherzer and, and Dina Scherzer. Um, Joel was a, another linguistic anthropologist. Uh, Dina had worked on, on um, uh, uh, Beckett, um, oh really? And and you know was was very familiar with avant-garde theater. Interesting. Um, we, um, Joel was kind of polymath in in terms of uh, his cultural taste, right. um, but we we you know 
gathered this team enriched by people like Pasqualino, um, who okay. joined our research team during the, the activities in Washington. Um, and somewhere along the way emerged this notion of developing a special issue of semiotica. Um, to uh, which if, your uh, Pasqualino was a, a contributor. Right. Uh, Yurkowski right. contributed. We translated the last article of uh, uh, Bogatyryov from 1971 uh, from Russian um, into into English. Um, we had a contribution from uh, Veltrusky, Yizhi Veltrusky, who was again a member of the 1930s Prague Circle had right. gone on then and um, uh, returned and continued his interest in, in the semiotics of theater and, and puppetry and masking and so on, as well as several colleagues from, from Texas, Joan Gross, I mentioned already, right. uh, Kay Turner, who wrote about sure. the icon of the Virgin and processional right. in Mexican American tradition and how the the inanimate object of the Virgin Mary, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe in this case, um, becomes um, interacts with 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 the community through these processions. Um, Joan, you see, talking about the Liège Theater, Pasqualino okay. talking about the the Sicilian and. Neapolitan theaters, comparing the two, um, Greg Urban and Janet Hendricks talking about Brazil, uh, Amerindian Brazil, Amazonian uh, traditions. Um, Ogi Benin, who is a great Sanskritist, but also had written about and studied Bogatyryov's life and work. Um, Thomas Green, who joined us in the Washington interviewing and documentation team, and right. so again, just somehow this this confluence of people um, all decided to uh, uh, address this issue, wrestle with the issue of giving some sort of semiotic precision, um, not necessarily in any single school of semiotics. Right. Uh, the, the Thomas Green is more in the Persian uh, schema. Um, uh, Veltrusky and Bogatyryov were more Saussurian um, by way of Prague Circle. Pasqualino, a little bit of both. Um, right. Um, and so there was no kind of necessarily party line in terms of what semiotics was. Right. No party line in terms of what performing objects were. Right. If I, I, in you, your, um, your contribution to this issue is is the is a pretty considerable article uh, titled "The Semiotic Study of Puppets, Masks, and Performing Objects," which, as uh, as we've seen in the um, uh, the image that I put up there a minute ago, was was the introduction. And um, if uh, if I may. Um, I, I, let, let me let me read from the, the beginning of this. You say, among the most ancient and widespread of cultural traditions is the use of material objects in narrative or dramatic performance. The form most f familiar to us is puppetry, the manipulation of inanimate figures by human hands and dramatic performance. Yet puppets are not the only objects we invest with the powers to speak or to move. And then you go on to talk about dancers who wear masks, bards who use scroll paintings or dolls to illustrate their narratives, uh, their narrations, children who create dramatic scenes in doll play, worshipers who bear icons in a religious procession, and storytellers who trace images in snow or sand all manifest the urge to give life to non-living things as they animate objects in dramatic performances and use material images as surrogates for human actors. And I think that at that time, <laughs> I'm speaking about this so you know his, um, historically, but in that time, that broad range was so uh, so different from approaches to puppetry that that started from a different kind of perspective. 
but and I wanted to just uh, read I, I remember one one incident um, a, a potential contributor and I was facing pressure from the eminence grease of semiotica Tom Sibiak who was the general editor of the, the semiotica and the, the dean of American semiotics at the time, who didn't want me, he wanted to keep a, the, the issue focused. Okay. And, and this scholar wrote, you know, uh, uh, responded to a call for papers and said, um, you know, um, this is what I'd like to talk about. And I wrote back and said, well, you know, can we nudge it in this direction? And I got this very angry letter saying, you know, in 30 years of scholarship, no one has ever told me what to do. And, okay. you know, it was kind of that that push and pull because I did sense a, a, a feeling from, from CBIOC of not wanting to bring in everything. Okay. Um, okay. And, you know, saying to this scholar who had very interesting things he could have contributed you know right. again can you can you bring out these issues and these issues and these issues and i guess the the arrogance of me as a, a, a recently minted ba student telling uh -huh. this senior scholar right. um you know that he should he should channel his his article in a certain direction was enough to turn him off. But fortunately, those who did stick with us, I think there is a cohesiveness again. And what we have are the two kind of poles, right? puppetry on the one hand, masking yeah. on the other. Yeah. Those are central poles or central, it's like a carnival tent in a sense where you've got you know, your two big poles, um, but then you've got around that lots of other things. Right. Um, and we wanted to, to, you know, cast that wide net, bring that, that broad perspective in. Um, we had a question I saw earlier from Brian Berlin. Okay. Um, and, you know, are there examples of things, processes where you say this isn't puppet object? Um, suppose at the extreme end are props. Um, and yes, and was, again, in the, in the earlier literature on semiotics right. of theater, props were not, and, and scenery and costumes were not missing from that discussion. They mm -hmm. were prominent parts of the discussion of live theater, of human theater. Um, what is the status of objects? So again, Veltrusky right. in 1941, and then again in his article in the, in the, the 1983 uh, semiotic issue, is wrestling with this this problem of right. status of the objects, right. um, and um, I think it was just as again as a, a matter of some kind of pragmatic imperialism, um, I uh, put this this notion of um, you know uh, images. Of of uh, I, I forget you you read it so beautifully a moment ago okay. but the the definition but no, was some notion of image imagery iconis, iconicity okay. um, or indexicality in some cases but in any case the importance of the narrative or dramatic performance so again not all of what today might be called right performing objects. Um, or I, I'm thinking of your wonderful Facebook uh, annals of object performance. Uh -huh. um, was, objects are are brought into the civil sphere, the political sphere, in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, sometimes images, sometimes you know uh, figures, right. you know human figures or whatever, effigies, statues. I think again of, of today's debates about Confederate statues and so Absolutely. all of those kinds of things. I wonder whether the narrative or dramatic component is fully recognized there. And I again, wanna... I don't want I don't want to insist on that. Yeah. That was just it's the the definition that that we arrived at at the time. Um, but it does seem that there's lots of what are now coming to be called 
object performance or performing objects yeah. um, where the narrative or dramatic performance context may be missing on the one hand, or they may not be images of entities other than themselves. I wanted to um, interrupt you here um, to, to, to take a, to focus on a particular aspect of, of um, your, your introductory essay and um, it, about indigenous theories of performing objects, their use and their meanings. And you were telling me yesterday that one of the, um, that you had written, uh, you wrote this uh, essay, Puppet Voices and, and um, Interlocutors, Language and Folk Puppetry. The, the super, super interesting, I think coming from semiotic li linguistic studies, uh, attention to the voice and text and sound in, in puppet shows. And you said um, your, that essay was rejected by an editor. Um, could, could, yeah, I'll, I'll tell the story. It, it yeah. wasn't, it, it was, it was it, at the, the time Dick Bauman, who again was part of the Texas right. team and my mentor, you know, was editor of the Journal of American Folklore, sent the the article out conscientiously for review, peer review, uh, you know, right. just um, rather than simply making a, uh, an imperial judgment to to publish it. Um, and one of the reviewers came back and said, well, my claim in the article that the puppeteers understood how language worked yeah. and therefore how the swazzle could abbreviate language right. and how a puppeteer could use dialogue and dialogue not only between two voices, but dialogue between a voice and a swazzled voice, a, right. a whistle or a, a, a buzz or a kazoo right. or whatever. Um, my claim in the article was this demonstrates that the puppeteers have a profound right. knowledge of the way human communication works, right. the way that language works. Right. And the reviewer said, you know, fascinating article, you know, rich in detail, preposterous claim that the puppeteers have any idea what they're doing. Right. And fortunately, Dick Bauman, as the editor, just said, "Blow, you know, ignore that, ignore that reviewer." You're, of course, you're right, because again, that was very much the the sense of the approach that the um, was developing at the time uh, at Texas, in particular, which was to say, it was, if we're looking at performance forms, these are a society's own encapsulation okay. of itself. Right. Right. We can take these as documents, as as analyses, as um, you know an ethno theory of how the world works. Right. Um, and in a sense then we're eavesdroppers and interpreters but the community itself, the, the, the people themselves have already done this analysis. And the reason why I think that's important is that like, even now we're in the midst of a cultural upheaval in the United States about the history of race and racism and especially African-American experience. And, you know, um, like a phrase that we run into a lot is, you know, listen to black voices in, in a lot different contexts, not necessarily about performance, but there's this, I, I, um, this sense of broadening the discourse. And the interest, an interesting thing to me about what you're writing for the 1980 issue of Semiotica is the idea that uh, analysis of, um, you know, the theory of performing objects is not something that, for example, uh, you know, like Claude Levi-Strauss can come and apply to the work of Northwest Coast Indians or that, um, you know, what your Western scholars come and attach to or use as a tool to analyze. But as you say, in relation to Khmer, uh, 
performance, you, you write, a large body of unwritten knowledge exists in the minds of older village shadow puppeteers, according to Khmer musician and dancer Sam Ong Sam. This knowledge demonstrates penetrating analysis by the folk performers over the years of the various systems of communication at work in a performance. And then you go on to, to explain the structure of this um, performance theory that's you know, coming from the Khmer shadow puppeteers themselves. And I think this, I don't think that's happened before in puppetry analysis certainly in the 19th century or the early 20th century. Maybe, you know, I, I think it's coming from the um, folklore studies and anthropology, but I, I think that's really important because it foregrounds, as I was trying to say earlier, it foregrounds a sort of global perspective and has the Western perspectives of aesthetics or theories of performing objects or theories of performance step back. So I, I just wanted to note that and I thought of that, you know, that attitude of the, these people who are using Swalwell have no have no idea what they're doing is mm -hmm. indicative of that. Right. Um, I mean, I think, you know, again, in anthropology, you have ethno classification, you yeah. have, um, you know, all sorts of, and, and again, in the anthropological studies of puppetry in the in the 60s and 70s, um, there are some people who, you know, did very meticulous okay. and and perfectly respectful of the native categories and the native understandings. Got it. Um, it's not that we were the first ever to make this claim. Got it. Um, but you know, in the same way, Pasqualino in his article sketches out, you know, a very careful typology of um, and and um again a a, a a native ethno theory of these two contrasting puppetry traditions yes perhaps it's more explicit than the puppeteers might have have verbalized um but pasqualino certainly wouldn't have thought he had any um insight on the puppetry that didn't derive directly from the puppeteers. Um, he was a, a lovely, you know, um, he, he, he would have been first to give all credit to the puppeteers for having, right. in a sense, worked this thing out that then he was simply annotating and, and systematizing in a certain sense, right. translating into an academic vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, Samang Sam, who worked on the, the Khmer shadow puppetry, um, um, I is also a friend of Samar Sam. Uh, okay. uh, not only the fact that their names are the, almost the same, but um, again, you know, was trying to say, well, yes, there's this whole native system of different vo vocal registers, right? Different right. styles of action. Right. Um, again, we know from Khmer classical dance. Um, you know, the different uh, hand gestures, the different ways of moving, because all of those kinds of things figure into this, this native theory of, of, of society. The other thing is, though, again, and it was, and I, I, um, um, it was Punch and Judy represents a particular view of male-female dynamics. Right. Gender dynamics. Absolutely. Um, right. It's not um, something that is, in that sense, disconnected or purely, right. Right. Um, you know, fanciful. Right. Um, it represents a, right. you know, perspective on working class gender dynamics, um, right. family dynamics, domestic politics. Right. Um, um, you know, and religion, relations to and re, to the police, yeah. um, right? And worldview, and was, and so again, as analysts, um, a lot of our work has been done for us, right? Because these these performers, over time within the tradition, um, have extracted and pre 
pre-chewed or pre-digested some of this for us. I wanted to um, I want to go back to, to shift a little bit and go back to a, a question that um, our friend Colette Searles from the University of Maryland um, asks. Does Frank um, does Frank define the puppet as a type of op of performing object, or are they side by side, as in puppets, masks, and performing object? And if the latter, can the two of you touch on the difference? I, uh, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, I mean, I, and was, I, I again just kind of pragmatically, I would see performing objects as the larger encompassing category right um and um you know i think of again a a, a carnival tent with with two two big poles right um and one being masks which we seem to have a certain you know uh conjuries of of forms that that many of us would recognize as masking we have another pole which is puppets which most people would acknowledge right. and then forms that people might or might not want to debate. I'm not particularly interested in that debate. I, I you know, to, for me, it's futile to try to develop an exclusionary um, uh, right. definition, but to say, well, had at that point in 1980 or 1983, had we just said performing objects, no one would have any idea what we were talking about. Right, right. If yeah. we, in in that period, say puppets and performing objects or puppet masks and performing objects, or you in 15 years later in the TDR right. um, book, you know, um, by then um, it conveys, I think, to the to the reader, a non-exclusionary right. perspective, an inclusivity, uh, a willingness to play around at the margins. Right. Um, and so um, and was, I, I tend not to, I was never really interested in, and, and again, I, I, I said in that 1980 um, draft, was, the African puppetry, the, the ethnographic example it's recalcitrant. We can't cram it into right. a particular box and draw a line and say, well, this is a puppet because right. it meets you know, this criterion and this other thing, which the people themselves may consider you know, to be a puppet, we're not gonna consider. Um, right. The reality was, was uncooperative. Um, and as, so. you, as you pointed out a little earlier, um, uh, th this category of performing object has since kind of expanded. I, I noted in your introduction, you sort of, you, you said you, you weren't going to talk about electronic performance or mechanical performance, which now is sort of can in many ways considered to be part of that. But um, so that the term has broadened or has continued to be useful, I think, and functional. But I wanted to shift um, in the time, we have about a little more than 15 minutes remaining um, to talk about your work after uh, the semiotica issue. Uh, you, you, um, you wrote a dissertation on um, Camus verbal art in America. Um, and you continued to make presentations about uh, Punch and Judy. Um, uh, you, you wrote this essay, The Co-Creation of the Comic and Puppetry in um, Dina and Joel Schertzer's book, uh, Humor and Comedy and Puppetry, A Celebration in Popular Culture, which has been a really important book. But you, you, you mentioned to me, you felt like to a certain extent, the semiotic issue was like, a tree falling in the forest and did anyone hear? Is that, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think, you know, I say we, we were able to stimulate some, some interesting activities. Um, parts of our team, you know, integrated this, this new interest in puppetry. Um, 
Joan Gross did her, her doctoral research and her dissertation, and I think yeah. it just returned from a Fulbright in Liège, looking 30 years later at the same um, puppetry tradition and, right. and, and other, other aspects of, of Liège life. Um, but um, I think in the, in, the, in the introduction, I also talk about Bogatyryov and in a sense, the tragedy of Bogatyryov is that nobody was pushing back. Right. And How do you, what do you mean by that? We have, we, we have Veltrusky in 1940 mildly, you know, taking exception, engaging Bogatyryov and, and you know, taking exception. Um, but you know, it was for then 30, 40 years, um, you know, it kind of, it, it fell into a, a, a silence. There was no one to challenge him on those ideas. Um, Yurkowski came along um, right. in the late seventies with an interest in, in semiotics. Um, right. Um, Veltrusky returning to, to semiotics of theater, um, you know, but it was, Bogatyryov in a sense could, get away with sloppy thinking or sloppy formulation okay. provocative but but incomplete mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unsatisfying ultimately unsatisfying mm -hmm. because there wasn't a community of scholars mm -hmm. um able to engage on those issues and yes he was part of the Prague circle and they were working on other aspects and there was there there might have been people hearing his lectures on puppetry who could use that in their work on on uh cartoon you know uh, theater right. or on popular theater or you know you know avant-garde theater um but there, was, there wasn't this community of scholars um, and I, I wanted and to again say... if we look at the, if we look at the introduction I'm, I'm sorry look at the program of that that right. 1980 conference there were lots of people working on puppetry anthropologists right. theater historians ethnomusicologists yeah. and others but there wasn't a community of scholarship in that uh, sense um, I, I, and it, so it, the the semiotica kind of just fell into um, you know it's an obscure publication it's not in a lot it's too expensive to be in a, a lot of libraries um i don't know if i think i guess they do have electronic access now but um it's still i'm sure you pay an arm and a leg um, right. for the mouton we should uh, re and re and reprint it right um, I, I wanted to i wanted to say that uh, thinking of my own experience in academia at that point like in from the mid 80s into the 90s like interest shifted um, into postmodern theory, and in particular, in terms of performance, a lot of focus on the body. So, the, and this, uh, you know, um, had particular connections to um, gender and and sexuality uh, in performance, uh, feminist theory. Uh, but for someone like me, who was interested in puppets, masks, and objects, it was sort of I was sort of like wait a minute, is, what about the objects and performance? Is anybody interested in that? And it, I, I felt strongly, I, I didn't know you, of course, but um, that there wasn't so much interest in, in that. I think now there is, you know, we're seeing in the past 10 years or more, a real development in, in scholarship in, in this area. Um, I think, I mean, you asked about how this connects to what I did later for the next 30 years. Um, totally. And there's this one, one very um, immediate connection, which is it was because I had worked on the swazzles and the voice modifiers in puppetry, um, it just so happened in 1980 that I, one of my other professors at Texas had a small grant to look at Southeast Asian refugees who were living in Texas at the time. Okay. And I knew that some of these ethnic groups used Jews harps or other yeah. kinds of instruments in the same way as the puppeteer swazzle to con convey secret messages in courtship between a boy and a girl. Um, and then um, I happened to 
accompany my professor when he went, Tony Woodbury, when he went to visit this Camus family in Texas, Fort wow. Worth, Texas, of all of all places, and said, "Well, do you, you know, use the Jews harp to, you know, communicate in courtship?" And they said, "Of course, doesn't everyone?" Right. <laughs> and they said, well, we can't give you the, you know, we, we can't show you here because we're only a few families. Nobody does that. But if you ever go to California, that's where all the Camus hang out mm -hmm. and we'll give you some names. And or so I um, followed up those names, followed up that interest. And that gave me then the next 20 years of ethnographic work with Camus, poetics, okay. ethno history, verbal arts language um and so on um which took me to southeast asia right got me involved then in working in vietnam particularly but in, in neighboring countries as well with a lot of training and capacity building for other f folklorists and ethnologists working in traditional culture um in uh, here you show 2000 um, I was in uh, Hanoi with the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology, the kind of leading groundbreaking museum in Vietnam. Um, and the UNESCO office in Hanoi wanted to support an activity with the museum. And again, the director came up with this idea of um, a puppetry festival. Uh -huh. so, so this is a very, a very unknown form of Vietnamese puppetry uh -huh. um, or uh, rods from from above. OK, kind of like the Sicilian puppets, but much, uh, much smaller. Um, right. So no, I'm sorry, they're rods from below, rods uh -huh. from below. But it's it's a it's not the water puppetry that, that people may be familiar right. with. Um, it's a very, very local. Again, one family was the guardian of this tradition um, for 100 years. Um, I don't know whether, and this was 20 years ago, uh, he performed, but it was not something that he did very often. Um, and I'm not sure that it has, has continued. Um, I want to find out more about that. There's a question that Deborah Hunt from, um, from Puerto Rico has been asking um, if she, ha, can we access that issue of semiotica? And I don't know if it's reprinted or I, I know, it, you know, those connected with universities, as Colette Searle said, um, she's gotten a copy of, of your article, Frank, from her university library, but you may not know about the availability of semiotica right I now. I mean, I know, you know semiotica is available electronically online, okay. but not necessarily through Muse or the, okay. the, the, the cheap and easy, the, the, the bargain plan that, that many colleges or universities would have, um, you probably have to pay or, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a much higher tier of, of uh, so if you're at a, a tier one research university, you yeah. probably have access to it. If right. you're not, you may not. Um, if, you, if you want to republish it, I'm sure that we could work something out right. um, I, yeah. with Mouton. Um, and, um, I think it, it, it is something that should be available in principle through interlibrary loan, um, or, or digitally, uh, through, through, uh, a, a larger research library. And probably some, some, some scholars pr might have PDF versions they might share with Deborah, if you contacted those scholars some if I should, maybe I don't know I wanted to um uh also uh Nancy Staub uh commented in in in, re in regard to the image of the uh Vietnamese um uh hand puppet form that um that there's a, a clip on YouTube mm -hmm. of 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 that wait a second um okay i, I think i i i'm not sure this particular tradition is on in the okay. youtube there there is a wonderful film that the ethnology museum made at the same time as and and the performers came to this puppet festival of a different yet another very 
little known and rarely performed form. And that is available on YouTube. Unfortunately, the one I could find, I was thinking of trying to show it, but the one I could find, the subtitles were only in Vietnamese. And there, there is an English subtitled version, but mm -hmm. I don't know that it's on, on um, uh, uh, YouTube. That's the, the Tay Puppet, T-A-Y ethnic group from okay. Tom Roque, T-H-A-M-R-O-C. And okay. again, this is, I was thinking when we, a few weeks ago, we were talking about um, puppets and their spirits. Right. Um, this was a, a particular, again, this is a, a, a tradition where a particular family was the steward of this tradition. Right. Um, they hadn't performed the puppets for m several decades. Right. Because the cost of doing so was beyond their means. Uh, sure. The, and the cost of doing so, meaning not the cost of organizing the performance, but the rituals that they would have to perform to have the permission of the ancestors to go up to the attic and open the box. Wow. And I heard almost exactly the same story a few years later in uh, Luang Prabang in Laos about okay. the, the, the puppetry, uh, Ramayana-based uh, three-dimensional rod puppetry in Luang Prabang, where it wasn't that, it wasn't only that it was difficult to organize right. a stage and the audience and admission right. tickets and those kinds of things, but the ritual of getting permission um, was beyond the means of the, the puppeteers themselves or their community. And therefore these things couldn't be performed. Um, I wanted to... And in this, this, this video that Nancy, I think is mentioning, there's, there's a very, very poignant scene where the man is talking about the first time opening this box after 20 years and the f absolute terror that he felt right. um, and shaking right. in fear that right. even if they had performed the, even though they had performed the rituals, maybe they hadn't been adequate. Yeah. You know, yeah. maybe they hadn't been sufficient. Um, yeah. I appreciate that, um, that, that, that your approach from folklore studies and anthropologies is, is pays, of, of necessity pays so much attention to the ritual uses of puppetry, which people like Claudia Orenstein and, and Terry Silvio in, um, uh, in, in, in this series and Jennifer Goodlander have, have talked about. We, uh, in the rema few remaining minutes, um, we have, I wanted, I, I wanted to ask about the um, safeguarding of in, the intangible cultural heritage because from 2006 to 2015, you were working with UNESCO and intangible cultural heritage has been so important for puppetry in uh, different parts of, of Asia, I know for sure. And I think Sicilian marionette theater has been granted that, that, um, uh, that position. But I wondered if you had thoughts about the role of the intangible cultural heritage uh, movement or system and, and its relationship to puppetry. Um, I mean, I think one thing I will say is that the term like performing objects, the term intangible cultural heritage was invented. Right. And it was an artificial and neutral term that was invented within UNESCO circles because other terms were freighted with historical baggage, folklore, or popular culture in different parts of the world or traditional culture, you know, whatever terms people might use, right. there was no universal category that wasn't problematic. Folklore uh. had been taken up by the Nazis. So you know, in parts of Europe, it was unacceptable to use the word folklore. Interesting. It was also in Latin America, you have the whole folklorismo movement which is again, a, a very you know, strange kind of take on folklore. So we 
there's in, in in American English we are happy to say folklore or folk life, um, but you know as an international term of scholarship of of art. Mm -hmm. Intangible cultural heritage was a purely artificial invention, which had that value of being inclusive on the one hand, not excluding any um, thing that we that would have been excluded if you had used one of these existing terms, <coughs> like folklore or popular culture do or you, traditional culture. Do you think and it's had the, a the the, the you know, I think the 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 purpose of the convention is to encourage communities to safeguard meaning to create the conditions under which these practices and traditions will continue to be lively and, and active and performed. Do you think it's um, had that effect or does it sort of freeze the culture in a sort of false sense of tradition? It was the, the convention has a certain purpose and then there's the mechanism of the listing, which was modeled after the UNESCO World Heritage Convention, um, where we have World Heritage sites that are selected um, and right. then destroyed. There's no question. World Heritage denomination is the kiss of death to any. Wow. Huh. <laughs> heritage site um, around the world it is but people continue to, to pursue it because they see you know dollar signs and international tourism right. and so on um, regrettably the convention despite its its lofty purpose and all the possibilities um, many of them go unrealized right because this listing mechanism is so pernicious huh. and counterproductive. The, the intangible and, cultural heritage site for puppetry forms, you they say? Well, you know, the, 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 the listing, to, yeah. to have something listed right. by UNESCO as yeah. being on one of, one of the several lists of intangible cultural heritage yeah. for UNESCO's responsibility. Um, it becomes a matter of com competition among countries. Right. It becomes a matter of conflict between right. between communities and countries. Right. As you say, there's the possibility that is latent, but but also often um, mm. made manifest that it it creates a, a freeze, a frozen mm -hmm. or or ossified kind right. of of form. Um, it um, you know, creates often unreasonable expectations on the part of the communities involved right. that somehow this will um, bring revenues right. um, that will contribute to the the the, the, the local economy. Um, occasionally, it does. More often, like say, like World Heritage, it becomes a kind of a kiss of death. A, I think fest, a festival that a community-based festival that that has an audience of ten thousand people um, over the course of a couple of days is one thing, and then if there's an audience of one hundred and fifty or two hundred or three hundred thousand, um, you know, it's the 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 very nature of that right. um, has um, been altered in such a way that the the owners, the community themselves may no longer feel that it serves mm. their purposes. And um, so I think there's there, there are some instances, some examples where countries have usefully put this process of listing to good, to good effect. They have I, used it to mobilize research for documentation and, and transmission programs, apprenticeship programs and so on. Um, there's a, a, a Chinese, um, uh, Fujian, Fukian puppetry, right. um, where again, it inscription was one aspect, but then there was this whole process of developing apprenticeship and transmission programs. Right. Um, again, for good or for bad, they're, they're you know not to say that it's an unalloyed um, success, but still there's yeah. some um, um, 
countries that have put this mechanism of listing to better use. It's, um, so it's sort of a double-edged sword then. Exactly, on, exactly. On the one hand, it's like global recognition that Javanese Wayang is worth saving and Chinese shadow theater is, is uh, a world, you know, a world resource. And, but uh, uh, but the, the, you, you pointed out some of the complicated responses to that. Nancy, um, Nancy about, does point out, yeah, yeah. let me, let me say, because I'm not sure if she's seen the latest version, but I was on the UNESCO Intangible Heritage website there's a wonderful resource that is this cosmic map of connections and interconnections and flows and okay. so on. But and it was one of the part of the process of nomination requires the submission of a 10 minute video. So we have uh, available on the UNESCO website, okay. the, the dozen or, or 20 puppetry and puppetry related masking traditions and so on that have been inscribed on one of these lists. There are these nice videos accessible. So, it, you know, again, for academics who want right. clips of yeah. the Opera de Pupi or the, yeah. the, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, Fujian puppetry or the, um, the Wayang from from Indonesia. Yeah. Um, you know, there all, all those resources are available. I and use them all the time in my classes. Nancy, right? Nancy has has compiled a list that I think she published in one of the puppetry journals or the Unima notes. But okay. you can also search by keywords, and and there's a kind of a, a um, you can search puppetry and. And pup search puppets and search masks, and you'll get an overlapping uh, list, and you'll find probably most of those on the UNESCO website. Maybe somebody, I don't know if somebody in our listening audience, ha if that list is online, if, some, if someone wants to share a link to the um, UNESCO Intangible Heritage list, or um, I'm not sure if the list that Nancy Staub is thinking of is separate from that. But um, we're sort of at the end of our time together, Frank. So um, I really appreciate your uh, taking part in this and sharing with us your work, which is so interesting, not only for, uh, your, your semiotica uh, issue which is so groundbreaking but but everything else i wondered if like was it was it worth it was it a good idea to make a semiotica issue we you... yeah no i'm i'm happy and i i think it does stand the test of time um i think it does um I mean, I'm, I'm very, I, I was saying earlier, you know, like with your annals of object performance, it's kind of like, what a wonderful resource. And, you know, I'm always stimulated by whatever you, you choose to put up there. Um, even if it, you know, and, and the, the notion that I played some small part in, in a sense, kind of planting this, this seed of performing objects as a category yeah. Of, of interest and analysis is important. Um, whether people want to pursue semiotics or not is, is, is less interesting. I think it's, it, you know, that even people who don't want to embrace the, drink the Kool-Aid of semiotics will still find interesting things yeah. in, those, in those articles um, and uh, observations that can be useful. Yeah. Um, and I think it, you know, it does, continue to have a, a life and an, yeah. an afterlife um, that I'm glad to see, so. Yeah, and I, I think it'll be interesting to see um, at least a little bit into the future. Uh, it, it's interesting to see how these things develop. They've, um, studies of objects and performing objects have been happening in all different areas. Um, you know, here's a, a new a new book called Shakespeare's Things. Um, you know, Shakespeare theater and the non-human world, which is really connected to that, and and other many other things as well. So I um, 
I want to thank you so much for uh, Frank. Um, you, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier. You know, your your work has been so um, important for me, and I've never met you in person. No, I think no. I, I, I contacted. We were supposed to. We yeah. you, you contacted me when I was still wrapping up my time at UNESCO, right. and you wanted me again. You wanted me to contribute to this. Yeah wonderful anthology the rutledge companion right um, and i wasn't in a, in a position to to contribute um at the time but again that's a just kind of looking at that and seeing you know 300 pages of yeah. meaty meaty provocative interesting uh things that that i would never have thought of shall we say um, well so um, maybe we will we can do collaborate more in the future and right. and and pursue things. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank um, my colleague, uh, Emily Wicks from the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry, uh, Manager of Operations and Collections, uh, and um, Elise Van Ness, uh, our, our student uh, worker assistant, and Felicia Cooper, our grad assistant. The next forums uh, include on um, August 13th, uh, Matthew Cohen, my colleague from um, the Puppet Arts Program at UConn, and on August 20th, um, Raphael Fleury from the Institut International de la Marionette, and on August 27th, Dacia Posner, who uh, together with Claudia Ornstein uh, and I are the co-editors of the Rutledge Companion to Puppetry and Material Performance, which Frank just mentioned. Tomorrow, um, Elise and Felicia are doing a workshop called Ask a Puppeteer, where people can ask them important questions about puppetry. So thanks everybody uh, for joining us today. This, this presentation will be um, archived on our Facebook page and also I think on our YouTube page and thank you again frank for well thank um, you no i've enjoyed the whole series and i'm i'm all the more proud than to be a a member having seen the uh the eight or nine uh, eight, eight of the of the nine preceding uh for uh so um, okay. i'm sure the next ones will be great thank you thank you thanks everybody